curled up in a little ball by the, the nurse's station. Um, and uh, I wrote the, all that I should say. So my brother-in-law is a nurse, which has made me like really in tune to gender stereotypes around nurses. So I should say like I'm highly aware that <laughs> men and women and everyone in between can be nurses, but that uh, I wrote, uh, uh, you know, if you, you don't think God could be a woman, you've never needed a nurse, right? Because right in that moment, if we think of the characteristics of Jesus as someone who rescues, as someone who saves, as someone who heals, as someone who comforts, like who was doing that for me in that moment? And it was this like we're nurse who was trying to, you know, get me up off the ground and, and kind of pull me back together. Um, so I think, yeah, one one of the things that I talk about in the book is um, the, uh, the scriptures give us these wonderful sort of very fluid images of the divine, of lots and lots of different um, ways of imagining and imaging the, the divine. And so um, I think that the Christ on the psych ward shows up in a lot of different places. Um, yeah. yeah. He's not Jesus who's like gonna kick down the door. Right. He doesn't have a sword. He's not gonna. He's not rescuing you. Yeah. He's meeting you there. Yeah. Right. Or I wanted to ask a particular picky theological question. Yeah. Was he already there? Yeah. Or did he come to visit you? Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Both, which is the sort of the paradox of it, right? I think yeah. um, uh, was there and is still there with folks who are there tonight, right? Um, is there? out on the streets tonight with folks who aren't getting the care yeah. um, that they need to be healthy and whole and who are out on you know outside on a just awful awful snowy icy night um, uh, Christ is there and the, the 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 mystery of the faith I think is how can uh, this God that we talk about in Jesus both be there in a very incarnate material specific way in yeah. this specific situation and also be everywhere, right? That doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, it wouldn't win you a lot of points in sort of logic class, right? But it's a- uh, This isn't um, systematic theology. <laughs> this is your book you back. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right, that's right, leave that's me alone. Right. You're not getting it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love this phrase in your book. You said, I was saved by specific people and concrete things. And I just, that is such a beautiful, powerful point. Um, our our uh, Wi-Fi went out last week, which is a terrible crisis, and <laughs> in order to make it through that harrowing experience, uh, we rifled through the DVDs, and we watched the film version of Les Mis, uh, which we hadn't seen for a few years, which was really sad. I shouldn't have expected that, I suppose. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it struck me, because I had been reading your book as well, the priest saves the soul. He says, I'm saving your soul to, to, to uh, Jean Valjean. But he does it by giving him the silver. Mm -hmm. It's a very practical thing. And Valjean is born again by tearing up his parole papers and by escaping his stigma. Right? So yes, I'm putting you in the same league with Victor Hugo. And, <laughs> and I want you to I wonder if you could say more about this. I don't know what to call it. This kind of embodiment theology. Like yeah. it's not an abstract thing. It's very real. You also said in the book, I don't remember what people said to me. But I remember that they were there, yeah. which is a help to, to those of us who want to visit. Yeah. So can you say more about this kind of embodiment theology, this, this practical thing that you're describing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to sort of emphasize um, in the book, and this is part of, part of that emphasis, is um, uh, here's what I would hate for someone to get from me telling the story and writing this book is like, I uh, had a mental health crisis, and then I got my theology straightened out, yeah. and like then I was better, right? That, like that's not what happened, right? Um, I needed doctors, I needed safe hospitals, I needed um, medicine, I needed people coming to visit me so that I knew I wasn't yeah. alone, right? I knew they needed these really specific, material, concrete things that are not on first blush particularly religious. Things. They're not the things that we would think of as like spiritual practices or anything yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. right? Um, that stuff was important for me, right? I, I, I did pray while I was on the psych ward. I did read the scripture, you know, I, but, but uh, it wasn't that I had this like, oh, I've just been thinking about God all wrong. And if I just kind of switch my thoughts around, right? That's yeah. actually switching my thoughts around was exactly that. The, the thought switcher around her was broken, right? That was, the, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and, and, you know, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think um, 
if there's going to be a, um, a spirituality or a faith that exists uh, in the midst of a mental health crisis, uh, it has to be something that can be embodied in these things um, that maybe uh, isn't felt immediately or isn't seen immediately um, as, as having to do with faith. Um, uh, Monica Coleman uh, writes, and she's got a book, a wonderful book called Bipolar Faith, and she would, writes about uh, being really, really resistant to take medicine. And she had this friend that came and was like, "You gotta have, you gotta have some faith." And she was like, "No, you know, everybody's told me I have to pray, and you know, this and that." He was like, "No, no, you gotta." Yeah, have if I can give some subtitles. Yeah. Um, if, if this, if like, if you're here and this is like a new side of David that you're seeing, you might not know that he's a really profoundly gifted theologian <laughs> before, during, and after his, his mental, his, his hospitalization. Um, I know because I was a, a, a teacher of his and it was like scary every time he'd raise his hand to ask a question. <laughs> um, and Monica Coleman, maybe even more so. Yeah, I'd say. right. So yeah, yeah. The, 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 the shortcoming of good theology or good philosophy or what, knowing the right things is, is illustrated. You're, you're making a good, so right. sorry yeah. to interrupt. But, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. somebody here. Someone so told, she someone she told says, you and her, hey, yeah. get your theology straight. <clears throat> right, well, and, and this right. friend came to her and said, you know, have, have some faith, and she was like, look, I'm, yeah, I'm tired of hearing that, I'm tired of people saying you just need to pray your way out of this. He was like, no, I mean, you need to have faith in your meds. Uh, he was like, <laughs> you need to like trust that you take these things that the doctor tells you to take because he's telling you that for a reason, right? Now, like, it, there's all sorts of things to talk about around medication and around the difficulties of finding correct medication. And um, I, I'm happy to share frustrated psychiatry stories with <laughs> you afterwards. But, but right, that, that was the shift for her. She had been in this, like, this theologian mode, right? This, this faith mode. And this friend was like, you gotta trust this thing. Yeah. You, gotta, um, you gotta trust the medication, you gotta trust the doctor, you gotta trust the people who are around you saying you need help, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, related to that, I think, I, I, I was um, thinking about, like maybe the first interaction I had with you. So, I used to teach at the school where David, I uh, just taught one course, one quirky little course at Wesley Seminary, and um, I think I'd heard about this David Hosey guy, his, 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 his reputation had preceded him. Um, I think I think I knew that he was in some way maybe starting to date my my friend Lee, a student who had become a friend, who had become like I was feeling a little older brotherish kind of relationship with Lee, and I was kind of like, who's this guy? <laughs> my little sister. <laughs> um, but you emailed me to say I'm considering taking your course. <laughs> Now, it's either that or the course by Dr. So-and-so. I'm not a PhD, so that was a little thing that he made. Um, I'm, and I'm trying to decide if I should take your course or this other course. And I'm like, thinking, who is this guy? Like, I, think, I think my reaction, my arrogant reaction was to write back and go, I don't know if you should take the course. Like, you know, like, you don't need this. Maybe you don't need to take it. I was kind of like, I didn't want to play that game. or Anyway, but it's... It, Looking back on that, uh, it, it struck me because as, as I got to know you better later, and you, and you did and end up taking the course for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was a, really an honor. Yeah. Really, <laughs> we're glad that you did. That's great. Um, and you talked. You told just some of your story in there. Uh, it, it's 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 been instructive for me uh, to to realize the complexity of things, right? Uh, and, and I think. I, I hope it's good for people, if you've had the book and you've been reading the book, I had this experience because we did a podcast last Monday, and it was like so relieving and refreshing to hear you again, because I've been reading about the David in, that was in this book, and I'm like, oh wait, David is hilarious, David is, is funny, he's thoughtful, he's, he's, he's not the, the, the kind of the weaker, broken person of this book. And then I kept thinking about it and realized that, that it's not right. My point is I think we're too binary. Yeah. Or maybe I'm just too binary. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that we that we want to have people be one way or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, but you are healthy and unhealthy. Yeah. You are smart and bipolar. Yeah. You are funny and you're anxious. Mm -hmm. um, that you're doing better, but you're always kind of wary. And I think I think you say in the book too, like I'm gonna have this for the rest of my life. Um, can you talk a little bit about, so, so it's not as simple for us as thinking like, David's, David's not well, or David's all better. Like You're in the middle of all this. Can you talk a little bit about like what it's like to be in that, that kind of liminal space? Yeah, sure, 
Yeah, that's that's really good. I, and I wanted, right, like you said, kind of, you know, you were thinking of me in binary, right? Like I wanted to be, right? So like I wanted, I went into the hospital for the first time and then after about two weeks, they let me go on good behavior, you know? And uh, I wanted to be all better, better yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, a hundred percent. Uh, and I, I was out for a few weeks and then I went back in and it was a really hard, that second time and then the third time, that third time was just so, it just, it was so discouraging. I mean, I just felt like, what the hell? You know, like I'm not, I'm not ever going to be better. And so I talk a lot in the book about having to sort of learn to shift my self-understanding through this process um, from me cruising along, there was a crisis and now I'm back to normal, right? Um, and that's how we tend to think. And it's just not true. It's not true for mental illness. It's not true for physical illness. Um, I'm at NIH doing chaplaincy work right now. We're talking about the trauma of getting a cancer diagnosis. If you, you go into remission, you get told you have to check back in every three months mm -hmm. at first. So every three months you have to go, you know, it's not like, oh great, good, I'm done with this, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think- a, I had a melanoma on my leg, I had, it, I had it surgically removed. I'm sitting on the couch with my wife and we're looking at the pathology report and I said, I said, I said I'm cancer free. Yeah. Yes. My wife's a nurse and she's very kind and she said, that's not what it says. Yeah. It says they didn't find cancer in the, in the cells they sampled. It doesn't mean it's never coming back. It doesn't mean it's gone. It might still be there. Like, the, yeah, I think that's, a, that's yeah. an excellent metaphor of feeling like, can I be done with this now? No, nope, right. I still see the oncologist every six months. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's like, then you have to have this shift of like, now I'm this person with this thing, right? I, I can't just kind of go back. And, yeah. um, and that was really discouraging at first. And then I kind of started to live into it a little bit as far as like, okay, how does this then shape what I how I think about things and how I think about vocation and ministry and friends and you know all of these things so I you know I came back uh, after being in a longer term program at Silver Hill Hospital up in Connecticut which by the way is where Carrie Fisher did rehab so I feel like I've like, I've like absorbed some Princess Leia I'm better for it uh, we were thinking of actually giving away wishful drinking as one of our <laughs> use the force uh, yeah <laughs> um, but I, I came back from that and I started working uh, with students at American University some of whom are here <laughs> um, and uh, you know it was like I'd been gone I had I was supposed to start in the fall and I had like started a couple weeks and then went into this long-term program so I had to sort of explain well, like where the heck have I been for the past six months so and lying seemed like it'd be really exhausting <laughs> <laughs> so I like gave a sermon where I talked a little bit about um, you know this is kind of what happened and here's where I yeah. ended up and here's some things I learned and I thought I could move on and like get back to doing ministry and uh, a couple students came to me kind of individually and said oh I'm really glad you know that you talked about that because I struggle with depression or anxiety or I have a family member who has bipolar disorder or mm -hmm. <clears throat> I didn't know we could talk about it in church so thanks now I know we can talk about it and I was like <laughs> oh <laughs> I guess we can. <laughs> so that's right. now step one in your three-step process right. of getting all this fixed. In right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, all of a sudden I was like, I'm in ministry as somebody with a mental illness. Right. This is like part of when I preach, when I lead a Bible study, whether or not it comes up explicitly or not, this is a lens I bring. Just like there's a hundred lenses we all bring right to the work we do. Um, and, and to sort of start to integrate that. Uh, I don't love it. <laughs> I like, like Parker Palmer talks in one of his books about how like he's learned to see depression in his fr as his friend. And like, I'm not quite there with my <laughs> I, I, I'm like, I'm like, you know, you're just, 
you happen to live next to me. <laughs> and I sort of like, you know, we got to figure out like who shovels the snow. On the side of <laughs> so I'm not quite a friend, but right, this is part of me. It's part of my life. It's part of the experience I bring. And there's these beautiful gifts within that. Mm -hmm. It's the thing in and of itself. I don't love, <laughs> but there's there's some amazing gifts of connection and empathy and learning in that. That. Um, that I'd probably give up given the chance if I could trade off, but, I'm, but I don't yeah, have that yeah. option, right? But yeah. um, and so to to search for those gifts, I think if there were really an easier important. way to get to that stuff. Yeah, yeah, right. I think I would probably. Yeah. I've heard some people say, not everybody feels the way I do about that. I've heard some people say, like I've come to the point where I realize that this thing, that's part of me, like I wouldn't be me without it, um, and that's really important. And and I think that's true. But like, if you gave me a magic wand, I. I'd be tempted. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, That's great. Right. Yeah. I, mean, I appreciate the honesty. So, yeah. so while you're being honest, now I've got you cornered. Okay. Here. Um, and maybe we can do this as a group exercise. Oh, yeah. This you know, this, this Rorschach on the cover. Turn to your neighbor. Tell them what you think this is. And then we'll ask David what it actually is. Milton's emailing Paul Super saying that. It's a survey result. That's good. I said, it looks like you're emailing Paul Super saying. Yeah, it's really good. All right, so what are what are some leading leading contenders here? I know Bat's pretty popular. People like, I posted a photo of the book uh, uh, on Facebook, and a friend was like, "Why is there a bat on the cover?" Like, okay, that's it, maybe not. Maybe that's saying something about you. Uh, other other ideas? It looks like a really rock and hipster stash to me. Oh yeah. There you go. Ironic facial hair. Other thoughts? Oh, nice. I like that. Anybody else want to confess? Two alligators walking out of a bar. Is there is there a doctor here that's going to analyze what? Doctor Rosie. Yeah, we've learned people. We've learned a lot about you. And so I have to admit, I like your. The thing you said the best. Oh, come on. What do you no, it's the thing that's stuck in my head. So, uh, well, Milton can tell you, when I first when I first saw the image, right, I was like, I don't know about, is this, a... and I like, but I've, I've, I've learned to really love it, in part because, man, that's a striking cover, right? Yeah. That thing mm -hmm. sticks out. Um, Paul Supase designed this thing. Oh. Yeah, check out his art if you get a chance. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's indistinct, right? It could be a lot of things, and I like that art. Experiences are like that, right? I mean, there's not sort of a story. There's not sort of an interpretation. So I like that it's a bit indistinct. Um, so I first saw a bat, and then uh, I had a conversation with you, and you said, uh, I want it to be a butterfly, but it's not quite there. <laughs> and that's the best summary of this book. Uh, like, like, I, would, I, would, like, I would love to have written a book for you all that was like, I was diagnosed with bipolar. And then after that, I won the lottery. <laughs> and my life has been beautiful yeah. and magical. Yeah, There's yeah. never been any struggles and I'm cured. And... Um, I don't know, buy this beard oil and use it. <laughs> so, you know, it would be great if there was a merch. Uh, buy it, but like, it's not quite a butterfly, yeah. right? It's like, <laughs> um, and so, so I like that. Um, I've started to see it as this, like, we're coming up on Holy Week, right? And um, I've started to see the risen Christ in this. And here's why. Um, all of the stories about the resurrection in uh, the Gospels, there's four Gospels, so they all tell different stories. Did I? <laughs> Anybody lose their faith? Jeff, you okay? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, there's four different stories. Four, and But it, here's something that happens in all of them. Uh, we don't have a camera in the tomb when the resurrection happens. 
right? So there's not in any in, a, in any of the four gospels it doesn't say like and then Jesus like stood up and was like I feel better. Um, it, like the people come to the tomb and Jesus is already gone, and it happens in the dark. Um, and there's there's this amazing thing in that imagery to me of the, the resurrection. It's this is the victory. This is the big event. This is the thing we kind of hang our faith on. Some of us, I don't know. You might not. Like. <laughs> um, and and where's the fanfare, right? Where's the spotlight? Where's the where's the trumpets? Where the it's it's quiet and it's in the darkness. And so I like that Christ on the psych ward is kind of hanging out in the darkness yeah. here. Um, I, 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 for me, the the thing about that is depending on when I look at that cover, and I've looked at that cover a lot. A lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> is I see it sometimes going towards the top of the book and sometimes going towards the bottom of the book, that the direction changes. And and uh, that it, it isn't, you know, it kind of going along with what you were saying. It, it, yeah, yeah. It's going different ways to me. It's not always ascendant. And speaking of Gospels, I love the, the liter and you read a great book, the, liter the beautiful literary piece that is the shorter ending of Mark, yeah. where they're terrified. End of story. Yeah. And that, that reminds me of what you're saying about like, okay, I walked out of the psych ward and it's not like some some victorious thing. It's like, uh oh, now yeah. what? Like it's a scary thing. Yeah. It's real life. Yeah. Um I'm sorry, you wanted to say something about that. No, I mean okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's real life and I didn't know. I, I mean I, so I haven't been back uh, to uh, to the to that part of the hospital as a patient. I've been back because um, I cut my finger up and trying to open a can of dog food. But, um, <laughs> but right, so I haven't been back uh, as a patient, but I didn't know that then, right? I mean, that was like, that's what I thought the first time I went in the hospital. And then the second time I was like, well, maybe that's the last time. So by the fourth, fifth-ish time, I was like, did it stink, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like I came back to DC and it did not feel like a Victoria century. And it was it was like, okay, we'll see day by day. And yeah. it was hard for another six, seven months or so. I was sort of like having a hard time getting out of bed and having a hard time getting to work. And Wesley Seminary didn't let me come back, uh, which was probably the right move, but the way they did it was not awesome. Um, things not to say to somebody who comes back from, like, don't say, we can't have you as a student because you'd be a burden on other students. <laughs> There's not a right way to say it, but there is a wrong way to say it. <laughs> and that's it. So, um, so right. I, this isn't a car dealership. Either. Yeah. It's like a, it's a Christian school. Yeah. 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 It's a training ministers. Yeah. Wow. So. Uh, shout out to Wesley Theological Center. Facebook Live, everybody. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, why don't they invite me to speak? Anyway. Um, <laughs> it's on it. You're on it. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah. Right. It, it's, I totally get that. I totally get those folks at the end of Mark. Who are like, what just happened? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you did a good job of this. You wrote a story that is hopeful but doesn't have a happy ending. Mm -hmm. So tell us all the secret. How how do we give hope? You give us hope, but it's not a cheap hope. It's not an easy hope. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us are in stories that we'd like to be able to tell that way. Yeah. You did yeah. Well. Uh, thank you. Um, my technique was I read uh, a Force of Will. <laughs> and I was like, I'm trying to do that. Um, yeah, um, I don't know. I wasn't particularly tempted to try to, yeah, uh, to tell to tell kind of a cheap hope story because that's not what it feels like to me. Um, you know, I'll say this. I think um, a really formative experience in my life when I was uh, just out of college. <clears throat> I um, went into a program called the Global Missions Fellows Program through the United Methodist Church. I was a United Methodist at the time. And uh, I lived in uh, Palestine, Israel for a year and a half. And I worked with the Palestinian Christian community. And something that the Palestinian Christians talked about a lot, that I learned a lot from, was the difference between hope and optimism. 
Um, because there's not like a lot of reasons to be optimistic in East Jerusalem. There wasn't then, there aren't now. Um, so uh, optimism is like, things will probably be okay. You know? uh, hope is something else. Hope is something that gets us out of bed in the morning. Or that if we didn't get out of bed in the morning, reminds us that there's another day tomorrow. And and so it's that right, it's that that hope in things, that, that faith in things unseen, right? And we forget that unseen part a lot, right? The stuff that you can't see, that, that isn't obvious, that isn't evident. Um, that's that's what uh, hope is in. So I wanted to communicate that real hope, yeah. and not sort of uh, sort of an optimism. And you know, like optimism has its place, right? And like. Um, that there is good reason to be optimistic, for example, about our growing understanding of the brain and the way that that can lead to better treatments. There's, uh, there's reason to be optimistic about uh, the success we are having in beating back stigma and um, silence. I am, you know, standing on the shoulders of a lot, a lot of people who, who were the very first people to break the silence uh, about this, including in my own family, and I, I, wasn't, um, I wasn't the first, right, uh, to do that. Um, so there's reason there's reason to be optimistic, but I, but I, I wanted to, to communicate something of that deep hope, and that that hope is in relationship, in knowing that we're not alone, in knowing that uh, again exactly in the uh, the places that seem most kind of abandoned or God forsaken, um, yeah. our faith is that God is in those places too. Yeah, I, and I hope that a lot of people will um, read this book and. and absorb it and ask a few questions like how do we get rid of the stigma how yeah. do we break the stigmatization and i hope you say did you read the book <laughs> <laughs> i think you did you've done that in sharing your story and that's not easy um i can't imagine and and, and uh and lee told me in the middle of your writing process lee's hilarious if you don't know lee you really should <laughs> she said turns out writing about the hardest thing you've ever been through isn't easy <laughs> or fun she said. Um, and so thank you for doing that and thank you for showing us i mean you you've broken that barrier you've, you've, you've shattered that stigma for us and i hope for lots and lots more people so thanks very much yeah